Saturday night. Welcome to the Jonathan Ross Show. Let's start, as we always do, by looking in the green room, and I'll show you who's on the show tonight. We have one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Please don't judge him by his looks. He's not just a gladiator, he also has a beautiful mind. It's Russell Crowe, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. 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 My next guest is one of the most famous women in the country. She's an actress, she's a model, but tonight is a very special occasion because she rarely appears on talk shows like this, so we're all very excited. It is, of course, Elizabeth Hurley. Yeah! Hello, Elizabeth. Wow. That's a treat. I've never seen you on a show like this. My next guest is a man of true erudition and probably the only one in the room who really knows what that means. It's Mr David Mitchell. Yeah! And a favourite in the country. Right here this evening. And you will know my next guest as Rose from Downton Abbey. She's also one of the most exciting rising stars in the country. She has the title role in Disney's new smash hit movie, Cinderella. It's Lily James. <laughs> and we have great music, great music tonight for you. You're going to love this. From the man who was jointly responsible with Daft Punk for one of the biggest hits of recent years, Get Lucky, you know that song. He's now back with his original band, responsible for so many great disco hits in the 70s. So get ready to freak with Chic, featuring Niall Rogers. <laughs> and his lovely bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wow. That is quite some dream room. I am excited. I'm shaking. I haven't been shaking this much since I took Jeremy Clarkson his dinner. I tell you, that's how much... <laughs> How much must he love steak? <laughs> I mean, I like steak, but not that much. We shouldn't really joke about that incident, because we have someone in the green room who is known for similar bust-ups, like this. <laughs> no, not Russell. No, no, no. Not what, I mean, David. David. <laughs> Truly, because, David, am I right that someone once bought you a bowl of carrot and coriander soup and there was a problem? <laughs> I don't, was it the temperature that was wrong? Uh, uh, everything was wrong. There were no croutons. Oh. <laughs> There weren't. There wasn't a spoon with my name etched into it. Wow! It was. You know, <laughs> am I to be treated like an asshole? No. <laughs> You're on your side. <laughs> now, let's get my first guest out. From a beautiful mind to master and commander, LA Confidential to his Oscar-winning performance in Gladiator, he always delivers. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Russell Crowe. <laughs> Nice warm reaction on your entrance, eh? Yes, what, what, what's the line? A warm yeah. hand on your opening? A warm hand on your opening. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so, Russell, you're in the UK a lot at the moment, it seems to me, because I know you were over earlier in the year. You decided not to go to the Oscars, I believe, because you wanted to go up to St Helens in an, to yeah, watch your I don't your know if you guys play. know, but nine years ago I, I bought a majority share in my childhood rugby league team, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Um, they were a championship team when I was a kid, but uh, they'd got into a situation where they'd just become perennial losers, and uh, I got absolutely sick of it. So I put some money down, took over, and last year, on the 5th of October, we won the NRL championship, the first time in 43 wow. years. <laughs> what a result, though. Yeah, it was fantastic. And then... That gives us, if you're the NRL champion, if, if you're a league followers or not, I'm not sure, then you get to play the ESL champion, and this year that happens to be St Helens. So earlier in the year, we played St Helens at their home ground. Wow. So we won that trophy too. That's incredible. That's like... <laughs> that is like the plot of a movie. You can see that being in, it made into a movie. There's a team down on their luck, and then a movie guy comes out and buys it, and he turns them around and he makes them a success. But is, there, is it true? I've heard talk that you might be interested in doing the same thing over here for Leeds. You've I've, been, I've followed Leeds United since I was a kid. The same thing. So I've had the same emotional connection. I love that club, and I want only success for that club. So there is a, there is a very real I'm getting a little bit impatient, right. waiting for, you know, getting the, the, the team to stand up and get back into the, the premiership where they absolutely belong. Let me go back. I was watching TV uh, about ten days ago, and Gladiator was on again. And I'm pretty sure it's on somewhere <laughs> in the world all the time. It's, it's, it's a, a crazy thing. Yeah. And, I, and I haven't seen it for a while. I got straight sat back into it, loved the movie. What a great performance, a great film all the way across. Cool. But that was the moment for you when everything changed, really. I mean, you've been acting... And everything went pear-shaped, as well, they say. Well, wh when were you aware? When did you suddenly think, hold on, this has had this sort of effect, this impact on my life? Um, 
You know, it was very comfortable to be famous after L.A. Confidential. You know, it was sort of... That was the sort of thing where all the cool kids saw that film. It wasn't a gigantic hit, but if you wanted to go to a restaurant, you know, the girl at the restaurant, she'd seen the movie. Hello, Mr. Crow, how are you doing? You know, or nightclub or whatever, and it was, it was fine. When Gladiator expanded things to a, a completely different degree. I think the day that I really realised that something was massively different, I was in Rome, actually, and I just walked out of my hotel and I'd gone shopping, and I was in the store, uh, in the, is it the Via Veneto, whatever it's called, and I came out of the, the shop and, like, the whole street, the entire street was full of people. You know, you look that way to the Spanish steps, it was just packed with people and that way it was packed and, you know. So I went up to this, one of these cops that was there because there's cops everywhere with guns, you know. I went up to him, what's going on, you know? And he goes, you were gladiatore, you were going on. <laughs> And then they all started erupting. This whole street full of people go, Massimo, Massimo. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. But it must have been a great feeling as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but scary as shit, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you got my little Cartier bag, go, oh, well, you know, sorry. <laughs> it's hardly Maximus, oh, 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 isn't it? Hold on a moment. <laughs> just put my just, wings down. Just bought a watch. That's all right. Just a watch. Um, you're, are you 50 now? Is that I'm what? 50, yeah. yeah. Turned so 51 in April. You must, it must take more of its toll on your body when you go oh, into those yeah. kind of movies now. But, but see, the thing, that's one thing that you can't explain to people, too. Is like, I, I, just, I want to be comfortable with my own skin. I want to play the roles that, that I'm, I'm suitable for. But, you know, you do pick up stuff as you go. You know, I've got a situation where I've got no cartilage in my toes anymore. Mm. I've got grade four tears in both Achilles. Uh, con constant shin splints. I've got bone marrow edemas under both knees. I've got a degenerating hip. I've got a bad lower back. I've got <laughs> ribs that pop off my upper right. thoracic. Now, these are all because not every take works out well. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the one that's in the movie looks like it was good, but, you know, there might be a few others where, you know, I fell off something, something hit me in the head. You know, actually, in one of the scene in Gladiator in the... The tiger fight, the guy that I was fighting against who had that big helmet on, yeah. I couldn't see. Well, there we have the picture there. Hit me fair in the head with that axe he was carrying, you know? And, like, that was a bell ringer, you know? But as you get older, you've got to be a little bit careful about the situations you put yourself into. Yeah, I mean, definitely, as time goes by, I mean, you know, the level of athleticism to do a role like Gladiator, I probably, you know, quite seriously could not achieve that anymore. Uh, but in Noah, you're still out there trading blow for blow with Way Winston, and he's, he's, you know, he's, I know he's a bit older than you, but he's a, a heavy guy and a strong guy. Yeah, yeah, I love Ray. We had, we had that big fight sequence in the movie, and one part of it, when we were shooting it, I, I have to lie on the ground, and he's lying on top of me, right? And, like, that split second just before action, with every take, he'd go, <clears throat> and, like, dig his elbow into my ribs, like, oh, God, so no, do the fight sickness, and, like, like, like that. Like, after a few takes, I go, Raimondo, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing that for? And he goes, very seriously, he goes, I am an older man, you are a younger man, but you should know to be wary of a man like me. <laughs> <laughs> He's still the daddy. Yeah. He's the daddy, mate. <laughs> oh, that's kind of brilliant. Let me talk about the new film, and this is an exciting uh, step in your career, I think, for you. The new film is called uh, The Water Diviner, mm. and uh, this is a film you're not only starring in, you directed. Directed, yeah. This is out on the 3rd of April, and it's a very different thing for you. And I was amazed, because normally when a director... This is your first proper directing job, isn't it? Normally someone goes into a fairly small project, and that mm. would strike me as being sensible. But this has got everything in it. I mean, this has got, it's got an epic sweep and scale, it's got battle scenes in, it's got lots of different locations as well as lots of intimate stuff as well. So you set yourself a pretty huge challenge. Tell everyone what the actual kind of plot is. Well, the plot is there's a man, Joshua Connor, he has, he's a water diviner for, uh, for a living, he's a farmer and he actually uses rods to douse for water because he lives way, way out in the outback in the desert where it doesn't rain for three or four years at a time. He has three sons and they all go off to war and they all get killed or shot in the same day. And the grief of that eventually drives his wife insane and she ends up committing suicide. So now he's got nothing. And based on a graveside promise, he travels from Australia halfway around the world to Turkey, searching, essentially, for the bones of his sons. And it's so clearly, uh, and when you see it, you understand, and it isn't a depressing film, curiously. You managed to pull that off, I think. It's very obviously an anti-war film. or certainly Unashamedly yeah. anti-war. But uh, at the same time, you know, life is life and you can still find... You know, yeah. a laugh, you know, no matter how desperate... The and light them up. But I was wondering whether or not this was something you wanted to do for your boys, because you have two sons who are... Are they 8 and 11? Is that what 8 and 11, yeah. Charles and Tennyson. Have they seen the movie? Do you... They have, actually. And, um, funnily enough, 
a little situation aro arose with my youngest, which I wasn't aware of, you know. We're having a talk about careers. And he said to me, you know, well, after, after he finishes university, he's going to go and do a couple of battles. And then he's going to come back home <laughs> and, like, you know, probably have a job, something creative there. And I went, um, just go back to the couple of battles thing. <clears throat> Why you do that? And he goes, oh, to earn money. I said, baby, soldiers aren't that well paid. You know, there's some tax benefits for being in the, the defence services, but not necessarily, you don't get a lot of money. And he was really confused. He said, really? I would have thought you would have got a, at least a million a battle. <laughs> <laughs> It's just kind of, if you think about it, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, you the point. You've got a point. You're putting your life on the, on, on the line. Yeah. So I explained it to him, and then he saw the film. And then he came to me and said, Dad, can we arrange a situation for my, my mate, Ollie, who's my, his best friend at school? He's got to see the film too. So we did, and, and Ollie saw the film. And then I said, how did you know, Ollie like it? And, and he said, oh, it was good, Dad. We've both decided we're not going to go in the army anymore. <laughs> so, so even if it was just that one thing in my own personal life, the three years of, of being connected to this project, yeah. getting my, my, teaching my son that, that war is not glamorous, you know, and that, that soldiers are facing, you know, a serious life and death situation. And, you know, there's unashamedly anti-war sentiment in the movie. But don't misunderstand that because... You know, every April 25th, which is Anzac Day in Australia and New Zealand, which is the day that we stand to recognise the sacrifice, every Anzac Day I will still be there at the dawn service and I will still take that minute's silence and I will still offer thanks for the guys that, you know, gave their lives so we can all enjoy the life that we have now. Because I think that's fundamentally very important, the honour that we should give over to the people that serve on our behalf. But still, when you... <laughs> cool. Cool. You're yeah, anti-war, but not anti the men and yeah, women you who know, serve. Anti-war, uh, but honour the warrior. Yeah. Let's have a look at the clip. This is the Water Divine. I think we're going to show you the trailer here. It's out the 3rd of April. It's Russell's first job as a director, and I can tell you he will clearly be doing more because it's a fine piece of work. Have a look at this. It's my job to steer my boys to manhood. I failed them. You can find water, but you can't even find your own children. Three sons killed. That was quite an ordeal for Eliza. I'll find them, love. I'll find them and I'll bring them home to you. If this is your son, he was taken prisoner. He did not die here. So he's alive? I don't know. But you hope? Hope's a necessity where I come from. I promised their mother I would find them and bring them home. A man by how much he loves his children, not by what the world has done to them. If you do find your son, what will you say to him? There we go. The water divider it opens here on April the 3rd. That's a couple of Fridays' time. Let me ask you about the situation over here, because you had a reputation for a while, or whether fairly or not, for being a kind of grumpy guy, sometimes with a short fuse. Mm -hmm. okay. well, I hope I haven't changed. Yeah. <laughs> I think you have. I think you've mellowed. Uh, what do you think of the situation over here with Clarkson? Have you followed that with the Top Gear situation? A little bit. OK, what do you, what's your take on that? Who's, where do your sympathies lie? <laughs> I love watching Jeremy on TV. I think he has a wonderful sensibility. Having been in this business for such a long time, I've done some pretty heavy days. You know, I did a 24-hour workday with Michael Mann one time. So I can understand on the bones of what I know, because I don't really know the situation, but if he's been, you know, head down, ass up, working, and he's requested one little thing, you know, which is to just be able to eat at the end of the day, I understand why he would get upset. You know, the way that he showed how he was upset, mm -hmm. I, I can't go along with, you know, so maybe I have mellowed. But in a you know, moment... And I of... feel for the other guy, too. So, I, I, you know, the uh, bottom line is, I think it's a storm in a teacup. The two of them should get together and, like, pour oil on each other and, and wrestle naked to sort out their problems. <laughs> I don't know where the naked oil wrestling came well... from. <laughs> That's an episode of Top Gear none of us want to yeah, see, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that. I must have Elizabeth Hurley on That's my mind. That's yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've met uh, Elizabeth before, I believe, have you not? Jonathan, I met Elizabeth Hurley in Los Angeles 
in like 1992 or 93. It's a funny story. I knew this actress called Deborah Unger, Deborah Carr Unger, as she's known professionally. And she said, I've got my, this friend of mine is in LA and she's got this huge Alsatian dog and she needs somebody to like just help her like walk the dog, you know? And I was like, okay, and you know, I'm a young actor, I'm there, I've got, you know, not really that much on at that point, you know? So I go around to, I have no idea who I'm going to meet, right? So I go around to this house, I knock on the door, and a 21-year-old Elizabeth Hurley opens the door in a men's business shirt and nothing else. <laughs> I thought, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It was just the most incredible moment. But over a period of time, I would go back to, you know, walk the dog, because now I knew what I was, you know. <laughs> I became one hell of an enthusiastic dog walker. <laughs> And, but just luckily for me, every time I knocked down that door, Elizabeth opened the door in a men's business shirt. <laughs> I love those days, John. Wow. Thanks for bringing them back to mind. That, well, uh, I, I think we'll get Liz's side of the story in just a moment. We're getting Ms Hurley out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Russell Crowe, who's standing here for the whole show. Thank you so much. Still to come on the show, we'll get Elizabeth Hurley out with her, her side of the story. David Mitchell is here, Lily James has got music from Sheep, so don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Let's get my next guest out. She's one of the most stylish and beautiful women in the world, and we're delighted to have her tonight giving a very rare TV interview. Will you please welcome Elizabeth Hurley? Yeah! There you go. So, uh, Elizabeth, is that well, what's your side of the story? Did you not, you only had a shirt in the house? What was going on when Russell was coming? I, I don't remember the shirt, uh -huh. but I do remember Russell. He was the sexy Australian that used to come round with our friend Deborah, right. and he was very nice to me and to Nico the dog. She probably used to call me like something like dog walking boy or something. Yeah. Dog walking boy. <laughs> well, we were both, it was early days. We were both in our twenties. We were both probably unemployed At the or time. struggling, auditioning, and um, I don't remember. I don't know if you remember you. Once drove me. You had a little car at the time, and you drove me underneath the Hollywood sign. Do you remember? We both sat there and had a cigarette, probably at the time, and we just looked at that Hollywood sign and thought, you know, one day. Did he? He didn't pretend to run out of petrol. It wasn't one of those deals. <laughs> He was very well behaved. Well, well, that's good to hear. I, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think there's probably a misconception about you, which is, I'm sure most people think of you as being a very glamorous life. They think of you being a, a very much a city person. But you're kind of a farm girl, aha, aren't you? you, you... I am much more country girl yeah. than town girl. You have a place somewhere, don't you? you well, I do. When I had my son, it got quite difficult in London to get any privacy. And so I bought a farm in the country in Gloucestershire and lived out there for a while and did full-time farming. So what kind of animals do you have there? What did you have back then? What do you have now? Well, I had cows, sheep and pigs, and I was very hands-on. I think at one time we had, I think we had 12 lambs, a piglet and two calves in the laundry room, all being bottle-fed, <laughs> all of which I took care of. And it was kind of fabulous. And now, I don't have so many now, but I've now got some chickens, alpacas and new piglets. Wow. Uh, yeah. Because, Russell, you've got a, you've got a, is it a ranch you have over in Australia? Yeah, I've got 1,500 acres in the bush in Australia. We run, I used to run 800 uh, Angus... But now I run 220. Uh, it just got too much from my mum and dad, you know, and I'm not there all the time. That's actually the guest house being built. <laughs> no need to show off, Russell. <laughs> well, I just didn't want to people to no, think well, we that, 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 that little shit hole. <laughs> <laughs> and no, way from, I, no way can I run 200 angles now. That must be like. 2001 or something wow. like that. Wow. Because so it's that's a lot all more developed now. now. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited by your new show because it's kind of... It seems so off the scale crazy. It starts here uh, on EUK. Yep. On Wednesday night. Tell us about this show. Well, it's called The Royals yeah. and I play the Queen of England. <laughs> it's fictitious. Nothing yeah. to do with our real royal family. I think within seconds... A lot of people have said, don't you think the English people are going to hate it? Aren't the royal family going to be up in arms about it? But not at all. I think after about ten seconds, you can see that it's fictitious. And it's for the E! channel. Yeah. So, you know, it's... Um, 
for the E family. It's heavy on the bling. It's more like, imagine if the Kardashians were a royal family. It's got that kind of vibe. It has, it has some of that. You're, queen, what's your, you're not Queen Elizabeth, and you're no, Queen... No, no, I'm Queen Helena. Of course. Um, and my son is called Prince Liam. <laughs> He's um, the Prince of Wales in this. And it's, um, it's fun. I mean, it's a drama, it's not a comedy. But it's, um, it's, it's light-hearted, it's fun, it's quite sexy. Yes. Um, I think people enjoy it. So this is, and it's just called The Royals, is that it's right? It's called The Royals. The, it's just called Royals? The Royals. Oh, it's The Royals. OK, well, why did you correct me? So it's just called... <laughs> uh, the Royals. <laughs> so, yeah. I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave there, so. uh, OK, so it's called The Royals, and here's a clip. This is on... <laughs> E-U-K, Wednesday night. Sorry. Look at this. Ellen Orgy, Flash Dance, Royal Beaver. My daughter, the princess, behaving like a common whore. But go on, amuse me. Explain this latest disgrace, but please, Eleanor, make it original this time. Robert's dead, Mum. Drama. Drama right now. Right. We go from Royal Beaver to one of the princes who's dead. Yes. OK. So, um, now, we have in it... So, there's the whole... It's not the same as our royal family. You've already pointed that. But there are similarities. There is a Queen Mother in this. There is a Queen Mother. And uh, it's a spectacular performance. I'm going to show you who it is in a moment. But there's also... There were two young kind of princesses in waiting who I can't help but think are based on Beatrice and Eugenie. You know what? They're not. They just have red hair. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> what a That's it. They're, I mean, there's no... Well, I see, now I feel silly for even suggesting that's the case. <laughs> you, said, um, you said it's sort of sexy. In what way is it sexy? Well, I mean, I took a lot, a lot of time off acting and it's quite interesting because now I've come back, I'm playing a different generation because I'm now... You know, mummy generation. And, but my kids in this, who are... There is Alexandra Park and a very nice English chap called um, William Mosley. They're kind of wild teenagers. And I think the whole point of this show is that, you know, we see the real royal family being fabulous and doing what they do, and we never see behind closed doors ever, apart from, I think, that one interview that Princess Diana gave, which I, I guess was illicit. Um, we don't see anything. So the point of our show is that you see everything when you go behind closed doors. And it's really what my kids are getting up. I, actually, the Queen's quite naughty too. But the kids are... They're, 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 they're normal kids. Yeah. You know, they want to do what every so they're, other They're clubbing, teenager. they're misbehaving within the confines that all young people go out and have a good time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would, uh, is your son allowed to watch this? Because he is... How old is Damien now, your boy? My son is very nearly a teenager, 13 next month. So he's 12, then. OK, so... <laughs> Is he a le would you let him watch this? Is that OK for kids? Because he must know what Mum's well, doing when she's out there filming. ordinarily, I would not let him watch a show like this, but as it happens, he was with me when I was filming and he ended up running my lines with me every day. He came on the set every day during the summer holidays. So, in fact, he's actually seen it all now. He's seen Alexandra running around in her bra and panties. He's seen the lot, so he can see it now. That's probably the greatest gift any mum could give a young boy. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Uh, let's, I want to show you who the Queen Mum is played by. Let's look, we'll show you this thing, because there's a reveal in this scene, and it couldn't be better. Look at this. It's another clip from the Royals. All rise for the Grand Duchess. <laughs> oh, I see you've redecorated. I'd love to know whatever possessed you to choose Vegas as your theme. <laughs> <laughs> the bitch is back. The bitch is back. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. And that, how is it working with the great Joan Collins? Well, I adored her. We tried to be mother and daughter a few times in the past, always got thwarted. And then on this, the director said to me, you know, we've written a part for your mother for one episode. Do you have anyone in mind? And I was like, Joan Collins, yes! <laughs> and they got her. She came, she did it, she was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, now, let me ask you a little about your personal life. Oh. I'm going to ask you as well, cos you're single at the moment, aren't you? Yes, I am. Are you actively looking? Are you not interested? Are you on Tinder? What, what's going on? <laughs> Can't imagine on Tinder, you're going to get a lot of swipes in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Is that the way it goes, or is that the way... That's the way it goes, isn't I've it? never seen it. I what? No, <laughs> nor have I. Uh, well, <laughs> so, no, are you... Uh, are you... I am... I'm single. On a sabbatical. 
on a sabbatical. No. So not looking. No. No, no, no. I'm, I'm busy at the moment. Yeah. Family, work. Yeah, I'm so working more now than I ever have been. So busy. No. So busy. Yeah. No time for love. No time for love. Mm. Well, so you're single at the moment, aren't you? Jonathan, but I'm, I'm going, I'm s single, but, you know, separated from my wife, and I'm going through an extremely slutty period of my life at the moment. <laughs> so, so this ain't going to work, then. <laughs> also, you're a bit too rough around the edges for Elizabeth, I think. Oh, you know, these country girls, mate, they like a bit of rough. <laughs> no, because, well, you say that. But you were with an Australian guy for a while, and he uh, he was glossed up, uh, and you kind of got the blame for that. But I don't know if it was your fault. This is Shane, who I knew way back in the day, and when I knew him, he was a rough old, you know, geezer's geezer. And then next time I saw him, he was like smooth and you know, new teeth and. That was nothing to do with me. Well, let's have a look before and after. Here we go. So this is Shane when I knew him. <laughs> okay, that's when we knew him. This and look at him after. Oh. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Not guilty. So you didn't, you didn't steer him in that direction? No. He just, I mean, look, he looks no. healthy and happy now, I think. I, I haven't seen him for a while. I wouldn't know, but... Well, he maybe yes. he's gone back looking like Russell again. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Comfortable, comfortable. <laughs> How do you... Uh, is it weird that people still... Cos when we were told you on the show and everyone went, wow, Elizabeth Hurley's coming, that's great. And they immediately started talking about that dress, that Versace dress. And that's something which still... It's ridiculous. It's kind of odd, isn't it? It's ridiculous. I was in America last week promoting this, and everybody said, you know, your dress has had its 20th birthday. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's bizarre. I didn't get it. Yeah, but that was... I was get that? it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bold look, isn't it? You don't have that anymore, do you? I don't. The Versace's have it back. Because I think Lady Gaga wore that very dress. The same dress? She wore the same dress. But when it caused that sort of a stir, was that, how was that for you? Because you kind of went from not being known to suddenly being everywhere, didn't you? It's a bit like Russell with Gladiator. It's a similar, you know, there's that point where your life just changed, doesn't it? Forever. Yeah, it's not for quite the same reason. If it was for wearing a dress and yeah. for... Maybe. Wearing a dress. Wearing a mini skirt, really. Yeah. <laughs> I used to call it my, my netball uniform. <laughs> <laughs> it was cute. Yeah, isn't it weird? I know. It's funny how these things happen. The funny thing is, I hadn't really seen that dress full length because at the time I was living with my ex boyfriend, Hugh, in a very small, humble flat. We actually didn't have a full length mirror. We only had a mirror that came to here. So I hadn't seen it at all until I saw it in the newspapers. Yeah, I'd seen that much of it. I hadn't seen the bottom. So, um,. It was a surprise for me. It was a ludicrous surprise, yeah. And you and Hugh, you, because you were together for a long while, but you're, you're good friends now again, aren't you? We're best friends, yeah. He lives next door to me, and he's godfather to my son, and I'm godmother to one of his children. And, I mean, we've been apart for longer than we were together now, because we were together for 13 years, and then we've been best friends for 15. Quite nice. Uh, am I right in thinking he's still single as well? Um... <laughs> He might be. Because yeah. he is. He's super smart, super funny. Yes, yes. Still good looking. Beautiful. Lives next door. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, Liz. Yeah, no, I don't think that's going to happen, but um, he is the best friend anyone could have. That's nice to know, though. I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, it's really nice having you on the show. I appreciate you coming along, because I know you don't do these kind of things very often. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. You're going to stay here as well, I hope. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Hurley. <laughs> And still, to come after the break, we have David Mitchell, Lily Jones and Chief will be performing live, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, Russell Posey, Elizabeth Hurley here. Let's get my next guest out. He's one of Britain's favourite comedians. He's star of the award-winning Peep Show, the hugely successful Would I Like You. Of course, it's David Mitchell. <laughs> This is kind of, it's like you're in the middle of two kind of like um, metrosexual lumberjacks. <laughs> <laughs> well groomed lumberjacks. Um, I have never been so described before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's lovely to have you here. You know, we were just briefly talking with Elizabeth about Shane Warne's change in appearance. Mm. You're a married man now. I, I knew you before, I know you a little bit afterwards. Have you gone through a process of changing because of your 
relationship because of your partnership? I, well, I think uh, yeah, my wife takes more interest in my appearance than I do, which is very logical, actually, because she has to look at me more than That's I have true. to look at myself. <laughs> That's very true. So, um, yeah, so she... Um, most of the clothes I own, she has provided <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, has she tried to get you into anything that was a bit too she-she for you? Uh, yeah, a couple of times. There, there, there was a... I, you see, I like what I call a normal shirt. Okay. Like this one here? Uh, yeah, exactly, it's, it's a normal point, shirt. Yeah, it's got a key. pattern on it, which you've remarked upon. Yes. So I'm immediately making a mental note. Never wear that again. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but she bought one that was sort of like, you know, like a, a T-shirt, but with long sleeves. And I thought, that's witchcraft. That's... <laughs> What's going on there? It's not got buttons down it, but the sleeves go to there. <laughs> Insane. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I've been talking to Russell about his children and, of course, Elizabeth about her little boy, and you are just about to become a father, of course, so congratulations. It's going to be the first time. <laughs> Lovely news. Thank you. Um, so you're, you're all geared up, you're ready for this big change in your life? You have, uh, you, you're prepared? I don't think I'm at all ready, no. I think, <laughs> I don't think I'm ready. I'm certainly not ready practically, and psychologically it's even worse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I can't, the, the thought of the responsibility is, is frightening. Terrifying. But it is, it's very exciting as well, and, yeah. and you know, people, people cope with parenthood, don't they? <laughs> yes, they I do. mean, you know, the, the world continues, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think it, you know, might be great fun. The thing that most impresses me about your home setup is that, uh, I don't know if you know this, but David's wife is one of the best, if not the best, professional poker player in the United Kingdom. I mean, she's won something like a one and a half million pounds playing poker. Seriously, that's incredible. That must be tough at home because you can't... I mean, A, you can never play a card game with her, I imagine. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, you absolutely can't play it. She will... She, she, she's very good at card games. But do you have respect for... <laughs> Have we I mean, most of that money she won off me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me ask you about uh, Would I Lie to You, because that has been a huge success for you, and Peep Show as well has been, but Would I Lie to You... That, how many series have you done now? Uh, we're just doing the ninth. Now, OK, it's a so. great show. It's now... Rob Bryden is now firmly in the, uh, the chair as, as the chairperson, and you've got you and Lee Mack. Uh, do you think that you have developed actual skills in telling whether someone is lying or not? Oh, God, no. Uh, <laughs> No, it's got... That's got worse, if anything. I, I, I realise I, I have no idea whether people are lying or telling the truth. And, in fact, I've stopped... My technique, such as it is, is to no longer listen properly to explanations <laughs> and just go with my gut reaction when they read the card to start so with. So the first thing they say, you just, just think... Just go, yeah. yeah. What, what, does the word true or lie appear in my head and, and that's as likely as anything else to be right? <laughs> I thought we should test it here with Russell and Elizabeth. Mm with their permission. I've got some facts written down there. Some of these, I know, and you feel free to make something else up completely or go with one of these facts. Some, I believe, are true, some aren't. Let me just pass without you seeing. That's for you, Elizabeth. Yeah. That's for you, Russell. OK, why don't we start with... Uh, well, let's start with Russell and then we'll... we'll uh... <laughs> you go first. Okay. Elizabeth first, OK. Um, I'm really scared of cupboards under sinks. <laughs> right, cupboards under sinks. Uh, when did you first notice this fear? I've never been able to open a cupboard under a sink in the bathroom or in the kitchen. And I think it's something to do with the plumbing pipes. I just yeah. don't like it. So you, you've never opened them in, in your life no, ever? No, I can't and, open them. And how do you know until you've tried? Well, I <laughs> sometimes try if somebody's put yeah. something under and I don't like it. I always think there might be a rodent or a little something or just something under there. It's to do with the pipes coming out from the sink and then going through the back, but there's always a gap. <laughs> Well, now, this is interesting, because, as I often find on the show, I have no idea whether or not... <laughs> it, is. it certainly could be true. People fear all sorts of they things, do. but then most people wouldn't be afraid of that. But then, if it wasn't an unusual truth, there'd be no point in putting it on the card. No point in saying, you know, I have a home computer. Yes. That's, um, <laughs> There's no fun in that. So it's impossible to know. So, well, I know, I'm, but you so have I'm to... So I'm just going to get my gut reaction. What was your gut... When, my when, gut reaction... When Elizabeth first said it, what, what was in your head? True. It's true. Wow, that's yeah. pretty good. good. There's no way I'm going to come up with truth. Wow. <laughs> Maybe you do have a skill at last. <laughs> OK, well, let's see. That's one for one. Let's go, Russell, if you'd like to offer your one up. Young fella, mm -hmm. back in 1993, <laughs> Elizabeth Hurley said to me that um, I was the greatest kisser that she'd ever experienced. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> At what point in the in the dog walking did you uh, did you get I to kiss? I put a lot of miles in. 
to get right. to that stage. <laughs> a lot of miles. Yeah, well, once again, it could be... We know, we know <laughs> there's, there's motive, there's opportunity. <laughs> for the glamour of the show, I so want that to be true that I'm, I'm going to say true for that as well. I've true. never kissed Elizabeth Hurley in my life. Wow. Oh. <laughs> hey, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think this would be a nice thing. <laughs> you know, David and I have never kissed Elizabeth Hurley. <laughs> or indeed each other. <laughs> there you go. I got close, but there was a bit of spam in the beard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how much fun is it to have David Mitchell here? Thank you, David. <laughs> OK, after the break from Downton Abbey and the new movie Cinderella, Lily James, as well as music from the fabulous Sheik, so you'd be crazy to go away. <laughs> Welcome back. OK, let's get my uh, next guest out. She has made a remarkable showbiz journey from above stairs in Downton Abbey to below stairs in the new hit movie Cinderella. It is Lily James. <laughs> First of all, Downton Abbey. I'm a huge fan. Lady Rose is a great character. Thank you. Yeah, let me just check. Russell, a Downton Abbey fan? <laughs> no offence. <laughs> you haven't seen it? Uh, not a single episode. You uh, should watch I'd it. Like to. Not a minute. Lily, we should get Russell in Downton Abbey. Yeah, I mean, how would you feel about that? What should I be, the, the gamekeeper? Yes. I Perfect. mean, yeah, yeah, that would be good. I, I could see that. I could see him with his shirt off, shovelling shit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the maids would definitely go crazy. Okay. Um, and if you're single. Maids, now you're talking. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, so it's exciting. It's really exciting news because you're the star of the big new Disney movie, Cinderella. It opens over here in the UK on Friday, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and yet already it's opened in America and it's been a huge success. So presumably you mm -hmm. went through the usual audition process? Yeah, it was long. It was a long, long old process and it felt like slightly like torture. Um, I went in, I actually went in for one of the stepsisters first, for Anastasia, and while, and I was really ready for it. You know, I'd got my worst jumper on, it was pink tie-dye. So this is one of the ugly sisters <laughs> yeah. in the play, I think. Um, Holiday and Sophie are amazing. Um, and then while I was there, I dyed my hair blonde because I'm actually a brunette. And um, so while I was there, they said, oh, you should read for Cinderella while you're here. And then... It went on and I got cast, yeah. Uh, I know when they make a movie like that, you have to make sure there's a chemistry between the lead roles. I mean, Russell, you're with Olga... Is it Kurilenko, you put it? ..in your movie at the moment, and there's a real genuine kind of on-screen spark there, and I know you're involved with the cast there. Did you have to test with... Who is it? It's Richard playing the... Richard Madden. The Prince from Richard Madden yeah. from Game of Thrones, of course. So did they do tests with you to make sure there was a spark there with you <laughs> and Prince Charming? No. In fact, weirdly, I, I didn't have any sort of screen test with him whatsoever, but I did have a sort of chemistry test with Mike in the kitchen, um, where they did a whole, a whole scene where I just spoke to mice. Um, and then I never even had mice when we filmed it, so it was sort of slightly yeah. irrelevant. <laughs> and actually, in, in my final audition, Ken Branner, who directed it, he played Prince Charming, so I was acting with him, which was just one of those moments where you'll always remember, because it was so wonderful. He's Kenneth Branagh, one of the yeah. finest acts of his generation. He was really good as the prince as well. well <laughs> bit old for you, though, Lily. Wow. <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was clearly chemistry with that big mouse. Well, right that's there, why I got the part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, let's have a look. This is uh, Cinderella, uh, starring Lily James. It's out Friday, and uh, it's been a huge shit already, but it's just going to go on being big, I think. Look at this. Ah, ah, in you get. Ah, oh, it's a lovely thing. Do stop whiffing on. Phew. <gasps> Ella, I almost forgot. Remember, the magic will only last so long. With the last echo of the last bell, at the last stroke of midnight, the spell will be broken. And all will return to what it was before. Midnight. Hmm? Midnight. That's more than enough time. <laughs> Off you go then. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Goosey, go! Goodbye! Everything you want 
from a fairy tale on screen. It really is. Uh, so when you come, the moment when you have to kiss Prince Charming, mm. that has to be a special moment. Do you rehearse that in advance, or how do you get that? How do you have that work on screen without it being too much, but without it being too little? Well, it, we actually shot that really near the end of the shoot, so we'd been working together a really long time and then you know the kiss is coming and it's Cinderella and Prince Charming so there's a certain amount of pressure but because it was Disney there was it was very structured down to like whose lip goes where and <laughs> what angle your head is and I mean we had a few goes just to sort of go with it well, um <laughs> who, who can blame you I know right <laughs> but um, um <laughs> And Liz, recently, I, th I think it was one of Elton's charity dues, it was a charity do, someone bid a huge amount of money to get a kiss of you. How much did that go for? Yeah, well, it, it, I was sitting next to Elton at this big charity thing, and a very nice man came up to Elton and said, you know, Sir Elton, if Elizabeth would get up and kiss my son, I'll give your charity £50,000. Wow. And Elton looked at me and went, get up! <laughs> <laughs> Looks to me like you're paying him, I don't know what's <laughs> Well, hats off to you, though, because you're giving him his money's worth there, for the look of things. Like, you know, it lasted one second. That's misleading. Yeah. It was a quick one. Um, <laughs> and you're just about to make, or you've just finished a new movie, a, a version of Pride and Prejudice. Well, tell me about this. Well, it's hard because whenever I say the title, I, I whisper the end because it's Pride, Prejudice and Zombies. <laughs> <laughs> and Zombies, that was. <laughs> um, um, so it's not completely factual. No, it's not... <laughs> <laughs> it's not the traditional version of Pride Prejudice. No, um, I, I played Liz Bennett, um, which was really nice because in Cinderella, I play a character where all her strength comes from within. Yeah. Um, and in Liz Bennett, suddenly you have her never without two swords and never far away from decapitating a zombie. Um, so she's really badass. She's really, she's really cool, actually. So you, you're actually... So they've taken the original Pride and Prejudice and just thrown them into the midst of a zombie attack. Is that right? That's a zombie exactly apocalypse. Right. <laughs> and how are the action scenes to film? How did you get on with the zombies? Is there a them and us vibe when you're making it? Um, it was really cool and I, I mean... Yeah, well, I just had to kill a lot of zombies, basically. And, and, but there was also... That's the thing about yeah. zombies, isn't it? Yeah, you, you have to get rid of them. You've got to kill them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there was also one time where I, there was loads of, like, fake do dummy zombies on the floor and I stamped on someone's head with real gusto. So you're, you're killing the zombies. Yeah. There's a floor full of dummy zombies. You're really in the really, park. And, in fact, I galloped in on a horse. And so I... when you stomp on a zombie's head, how do you... Show me, give an idea of that. You really... I mean, I'm just going to make sure I don't flash my underwear. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, yeah. you go for it. And I really went for it. And then um, I realised that it wasn't, in fact, a dummy, but an extra. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was bad, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> <laughs> because he was fine. <laughs> he's not. He's not damaged. No, but it was this weird moment where I did it, and then and then I sort of saw commotion behind the cameras, and I was like, "What's going on?" And I'm doing a really good job here, and then. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good a job. Too good. But he had blood, and he had an axe that he was holding that was coming out of his head, and. Um, and then I ra and they told me that's that's an extra, and I ran over, and he didn't move, and I wasn't sure if he was concussed or just really in character. <laughs> but they gave him gave him an extra hundred quid at the end of the day. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, and that, if I was an extra zombie, I'd be filled with that. <laughs> I'd be filled with that anyway. <laughs> I love your laugh. <laughs> It's kind of. It's like. It's a real smart. It's a real smart. It's charming. It's lovely. I'm not being. I love it. <laughs> Lily, what a pleasure meeting you. What a Thank charming you. young person you are. It's so lovely having the show. The movie's been huge already, but good luck. I can't wait to see you in the zombie killing extravaganza. <laughs> uh, uh, do you think we'll see that scene? Will we see that poor extra getting a kicking from you? Are they going um, to. They definitely. It was a filmed rehearsal, so that it, it is somewhere. So he'll maybe use it as a lawsuit against me, maybe <laughs> one day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's setting me off. He's such a great laugh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Thanks to David, thanks to Elizabeth, thanks to us and all my guests tonight. Next week on the show, I'll be joined by Keanu Reeves, will be here, Catherine Tate and Russell Brand, and we have music and chat from Ollie Moores. But now, with I'll Be There, featuring Niall Rogers, of course, the fabulous Chic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Into the disco scene. Now, Rogers, ladies and gentlemen, wow.